turbochargers. They're one of the most, if not the most, sought after modification for your car. They make all the cool sounds we want our cars to make. Spooling. Flutter. Blow off. And plenty of others. So in today's video, we're going to be going over both the history and the mechanics of the turbocharger. To start off, the full name of a turbo is actually a turbo supercharger. Back when it was first created, every type of force induction was called a supercharger. The supercharger was first invented in 1885, with the turbo coming 20 years later in 1905. Thus, the turbo bared the supercharger name. The turbo began becoming useful where most performance engine parts got their fame, in planes. The turbo gained its first use in planes in the 20s, and really began to find use during World War II. It was used in such famous planes as the B-17, and planes like the Spitfire using a supercharged engine. The famous turbo company Garrett started in 1936 by J.C. Cliff Garrett and actually created the turbos on the B-17. The first turbocharged cars were the 1962 to 1963 Oldsmobile Jetfire. What's the Jetfire got that's so new and different? Watch! That's what. New from Olds. Only from Olds. Jetfire's got the sensational power and acceleration of the revolutionary turbo rocket engine, a turbocharged fluid-injected V8 that gives you true high compression performance. And the 1962 to 1964 Chevy Corvair Monza Spider. Go, man, go. Go for true sports car feel and handling. Go for thrills and excitement. Go for the powerful thrust of turbocharged scat. This is the sizzling Corvair Monza Spider with a whopping big 150 horsepower turbo air engine. The Jetfire had a 215 cubic inch V8 with a turbo, and the Monza had a 260 cubic inch V8 also with a turbo. They were both pretty crap and had a lot of issues. In the 1970s, during the oil crisis, turbos really began to come into their own on the everyday cars. They drastically increased efficiency on smaller displacement engines and used less gas for the same power. Formula One began using turbos in the 70s as well. In the 80s, the turbo really began to take off as a performance item. The Buick Grand National X introduced turbos to the US as a series part. The Dots and 280ZX turbo showed the world what Japan can really do with force induction. And the Porsche 930 Turbo has become one of the most iconic cars ever. Today, turbo cars are left and right, whether they're in small copy cars or insanely overpowered supercars. But how do they actually work? Now, what does a turbocharger actually do? Let's say you want to make more power, and you're going to need more combustion. More explosions means more power. You can always add more fuel to the mixture, but eventually it'll get too rich and run bad. You need a good mixture of air and fuel together. More fuel means you need more air. You could always get a bigger air filter and wider intake tubing, but even that will eventually be too little. What you're gonna need is air to be physically pumped into the engine, what's known in the car scene as forced induction. In the most basic of terms, a turbo or supercharger is an air pump. The only difference is where you get the energy to drive the pump. Superchargers just attach a belt directly to the crankshaft, but that has a parasitic effect on power. A turbo, however, uses an energy source that is normally wasted, the exhaust gases. Exhaust carries a lot of energy in the form of heat and momentum that's normally just vented straight out the back of the car. What a turbo does is act as a small windmill, taking energy from the exhaust and using it to spin a turbine. Hey guys, in front of me I've got a TD04 turbocharger. This is a very popular turbo. It came on the WRX from 02 to 07 in the US. Um, so these are pretty much everywhere. 
you can find them on a lot of things. This is the Subaru version of it, so it's meant to go on Subaru downpipes and uppipes. Um, but they also made it for bubbles and everything. So this is a very popular turbo. Um, I'm going to be using it on my car. But while it's not in my car, I can actually show you a lot of the mechanics of the turbo. Um, what we're looking at here, the darker side of the turbo, is actually it's called the turbine side. This is the side that deals with all the exhaust. It connects both the up pipe and the down pipe. On Subarus, I know it's called the up pipe. It's the pipe that connects the exhaust headers coming straight from the engine to the actual turbocharger itself. So let's say you've got your exhaust headers, they come through, they come up on the Subaru engine into the turbine. The hot exhaust gases, which have a lot of pressure on them, spin this turbine um, wheel in here um, to actually get the energy from the exhaust. So that wheel gets spun very fast, and then the exhaust, after spinning that wheel, comes out the downpipe. The downpipe mounts right here. So basically, it's basically the side that connects the uppipe and the downpipe of the turbo, and it's the side that harnesses all the energy from the turbo or from the exhaust gases. It's basically the windmill side of the turbo. It wants to collect all this hot pressure, pressurized gas. It wants to get all the energy from that. So it's got a little fan in there that gets spun by that and then put out. Now right here, we've got the wastegate. Um, the wastegate is connected to the turbine side of this turbocharger. It's called a internal wastegate. We'll get into that later, but most stock turbos have the wastegate connected to the turbine side of the turbo if it's an internal wastegate. Moving on to the compressor side, um, this is the side that's the most recognizable part of the turbo. This is the one you see on all the t-shirts, all the stickers, everything. You see this side of the turbo, it's the most popular side because it's the cleanest side and the most visible side on a lot of cars. And I think personally it just looks the best. Now this is the side that controls all the air. So air will go in this hole um, from the intake. Let's say you've got a filter back here, goes into a pipe, goes through this side of the turbo, there's a turbine in here, or a compressor in here, that actually spins very fast and pressurizes that air. Air comes through here and comes out this side of the turbo. This side of the turbo will go through an intercooler, um, get cooled down because these turbos actually get extremely hot because they're spinning at such a high rotation. Um, so if the air is super hot, you want to cool it down, it'll go through an intercooler, which is basically just a radiator for air and then it goes through your intake so after this side of the turbo you're making boost you're making boost pressure um, so this is the side that's connected to the intake and the intercooler um, the fan in here the compressor fan is driven by the turbine fan um, by a connecting shaft the center housing is just the part in the middle of the turbo um, it contains the connecting shaft between both these turbines so as the between both these I guess blades the turbine is spun up by the exhaust and thus spins directly connected it spins the compressor side so these are spinning in parallel exactly the same rotation so the energy from this is driving this side and compressing the air in here we've got the coolant and oil um, oil is used to lubricate that shaft since it's spinning so fast and all the moving parts within the turbo and the coolant is used to obviously cool down the turbo. This down here is an oil line. I think this may also be an oil line here and I think these are uh, coolant lines. I'm not too sure. I'm not too familiar with this exact turbocharger and I haven't really worked on my car enough to know but just know that these lines are actually the lines that control the coolant and the oil within the turbo. Um, and that's pretty much it for the center housing and the turbocharger mechanics in general. If you're wondering what this thing up here is, it's called the wastegate. Um, this has an internal wastegate, which we will get into the difference between those in a second. The way you actually control how much boost the turbo makes is fairly simple. You use a wastegate. Now how does a wastegate work? The only way to keep the turbo from spinning faster and faster definitely is to bypass some of the exhaust gases past the turbine. You do that by opening a valve, either on the turbo or outside it. This is called the wastegate. On my turbo, it has an internal wastegate that'll open at around 8 to 9 psi. A vacuum line connects the pressurized side of the intake to the wastegate so it can read pressure. When the wastegate sees a certain pressure, let's say 8 psi, it will open the bypass valve so that the turbine doesn't keep spinning. Wastegates can either be internal or external. Internal is the most common for a stock turbo. This means the wastegate and its valve is attached directly to the turbo. The valve is placed on the turbine side of the turbo as seen on the TDO4. 
With an external wastegate, you have a separate pipe leading from the exhaust headers before the turbo. The wastegate valve on that pipe, and either another pipe back to the exhaust post-turbo, or to a pipe that dumps to atmosphere. Dumping to atmosphere is the better option for performance as you reduce exhaust back pressure on the turbo and can make a bit more power. This is also the reason you see a lot of turbo cars with two exhaust pipes of different sizes. The smaller pipe is the open wastegate. The wastegate is controlled by a boost controller that is either electronic or manual. The boost controller creates a leak in the wastegate vacuum line, so it reads a lower false boost pressure and fails to open the valve. Most stock cars are controlled by the ECU through a boost controller solenoid, a form of electronic boost controller. Aftermarket, an electronic boost controller is the preferred option as you can set your boost accurately and safely, but is significantly more expensive. A manual boost controller connects to the wastegate and does the same thing as an electronic boost controller, but with a ball and spring valve rather than an electronic actuator. Manual controllers are more difficult to set and require a boost gauge to get a safe boost level. If you set the controller wrong, then you could overboost and blow the engine. Now a boost gauge is really simple. All it does is measure the pressure the turbo is actually pushing through the intake. All you have to do is tap into a vacuum line that reads pressure post-turbo. On my car it reads pressure from the intake manifold. So you've made your boost and accelerated, but now you want to slow down and let off the throttle. The turbo is still going to spin and push boost through the engine even after the throttle has been closed. It's recommended that you let off the boost pressure using either a blow valve or bypass valve. The difference between the two is that a blow valve opens and releases the excess boost pressure directly to the atmosphere, making a whoosh sound. And a bypass valve that vents the excess boost pressure back into the intake pre-turbo. Sometimes people don't release the boost pressure at all and create a back pressure in the intake. This spins the compressor wheel back and forth, creating that classic turbo flutter we all know and love. Also exists hybrid kits of blow valves and bypass valves that both vent to atmosphere and back into the intake. Now there are a few different types of turbo setups, but the differences are fairly simple to understand. There's single turbo that we already know, and twin turbo. A twin turbo setup can either be in parallel or in sequence. In parallel means that the twin turbos are boosted by different sides of the engine. Let's say a V6 with three cylinders on one side boosting one turbo, and the other three boosting another turbo. Then those two turbos combine their pressure into the intake together. In sequence means that the two turbos actually boost into each other. Normally, a smaller turbo begins to spool and provide boost through a larger turbo and into the engine. As the power climbs, the bigger turbo spools and they work in parallel, boosting into each other to boost the engine. Next up we're going to talk about different shapes that manufacturers have come up with for their turbos. First is twin scroll. A twin scroll turbo has two different chambers on the turbine side that are driven by different cylinders. For example, a four cylinder engine could have two cylinders driving one chamber of the turbine and another two cylinders driving the other chamber. This would mean you would have a split or two separate up pipes. Second, we have a variable geometry turbo. Now it sounds complicated, but it is really not. Now we should know that a smaller turbo spools up at a lower RPM and a bigger turbo spools up at higher RPM. So what if we had one turbo that could change from big to small? That's exactly what a variable geometry turbo does. It changes the shape of the turbine chamber to achieve the optimal shape of the engine RPM. At lower RPM, it makes the chamber smaller, and at higher RPM, it makes the chamber bigger. Turbos are very fun and are actually fairly easy to understand after a bit of research. If you didn't understand everything in the video, watch it again or check out a couple of the videos linked in the corner. Thanks for watching.